and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. For the past few videos, we've looked at the interactions between light and matter, and how these are detected during an experiment in absorption or emission spectroscopy. In the last video, we looked at the phenomenon of phosphorescence, and we saw that electronic states can have different multiplicities. For example, the excited states involved with phosphorescence are a singlet state and a triplet state, and these are two different multiplicities. What exactly does that mean? That's what I want to talk about in today's video. To begin with, we need to remind ourselves that an electron has two different types of angular momentum. Intrinsic angular momentum, also known as spin, which has the symbol s, and orbital angular momentum, which has the symbol script L. Remember, the reason we call the first property spin is because the electron behaves as though it were rotating around an axis, much like a spinning top or the rotation of the Earth around its axis. Meanwhile, orbital angular momentum is similar to the angular momentum of the Earth resulting from its motion as it orbits the Sun. So, just as the Earth has both orbital and intrinsic angular momentum, so does an electron. But as we've seen, it's important to remember that because an electron behaves like a wave, these forms of angular momentum for an electron don't exactly behave like they do for two solid objects, like the Earth and Sun. Anyway, because of these different types of momentum, several different kinds of interaction can occur between different electrons. For example, the orbital angular momentum of one electron can be coupled to the orbital angular momentum of another electron. This is known as a Coulombic interaction. When we say that the momenta are coupled, what we mean is that the momenta of the two electrons can interfere with each other. So this is another demonstration that electrons actually behave like waves. The momenta of solid, non-wave-like particles would not couple in this way. As a result of this interference, the overall orbital momentum of the particles may be greater than either of the individual momenta, or it may be less, or it may even be zero. When two orbital angular momenta couple, the overall momentum will be somewhere in this range. The lower limit is the absolute value of the difference between the two individual momenta, and the upper limit is the sum of the two momenta. The overall orbital angular momentum has the symbol capital L instead of lowercase l. For example, suppose our system includes a p electron and an f electron. What will be the overall orbital angular momentum? As you might recall from your general chemistry course, a p electron has an l value of 1, and an f electron has an l of 3. If we plug those values into the equation for the overall orbital momentum, we can see that the lower and upper limits are 2 and 4. So capital L can have values of 2, 3, or 4. It's important to note that Coulombic coupling is only a quantum phenomenon. That means it only happens in atom or molecule size systems. It's not something that would happen in the large-scale world we can see with our eyes. In the large-scale world, the overall momentum could be 2 or 4, but the result L equals 3 would never be possible. Anyway, just as we saw that the orbital angular momenta of two different electrons can couple, it turns out that the spin angular momenta can couple too. As a result, we have this equation for the overall spin angular momentum of two electrons that are coupled, where the total spin has a symbol capital S. This type of interaction is called spin correlation. But wait, as you might remember, the spin of an electron can only be plus or minus one half. That has some interesting consequences. For example, suppose we have two electrons that are interacting and they both have spin positive one half. 
Plugging that into the limits for s shows that the overall spin can have a lower limit of 0 and an upper limit of 1. But we get the same result if both spins are negative 1 half, and if the spins are opposite of each other. Based on that discussion, it sounds like there must be three states that have an overall spin of 0 and three that have an overall spin of 1. The s equals 0 states would all be degenerate, meaning they'd have the same energy. And the s equals 1 states would also be threefold degenerate. But that's actually not correct. Because of the way wave functions combine, there's actually only one state that has an overall spin of 0. It turns out that this is always true for paired spins. In other words, particles whose spins have opposite signs. The number of states that can have a particular value of capital S is called the multiplicity. The multiplicity of a system is given by the formula 2s plus 1. So, for example, if the total spin angular momentum is 0, then the multiplicity of the system is 2 times 0 plus 1, or 1. This is known as a singlet. If the total spin is 1, then the multiplicity of the system equals 3, which is called a triplet. Other values of capital S can result in doublets or quartets, and so on. Why is that important? Well, ordinarily, the different states of a doublet, triplet, quartet, and so on have exactly the same energy. In other words, they're degenerate. However, that's not true anymore if the system is in an external electric or magnetic field. And that's exactly what we have in a molecule. The other nuclei and electrons in a molecule generate an electromagnetic field, so the energies of the states in a doublet, a triplet, etc. are all usually slightly different. As a result, if we take a very precise spectrum of a molecule, we'll see different peaks for the different states, though these will usually be very close in energy. So, if the system has a doublet, we will see two peaks. If it's a triplet, there will be three peaks, and so on. This is especially important for NMR spectra, where the sample is in a very strong magnetic field, so the peaks in a multiplet are very easy to distinguish. So, suppose we have an atom, and we want to know the range of capital S values it could have. How do we determine that? The first step is to write out the electron configuration of the atom, as you learn to do in general chemistry. For example, suppose we have a manganese atom. We can get the electron configuration of manganese by looking at the periodic table. If we do, we can see that the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d5. That's 25 electrons. At first, it seems like an awful lot of electrons to keep track of. But luckily, the only electrons we need to worry about are the ones in the 3d orbital. Why is that? Well, the other orbitals are all completely full. That means the electrons in those orbitals are paired up so that their spins have opposite values. You might remember seeing this when we looked at orbital diagrams back in video 21. As you can see, the overall spin for paired electrons is equal to zero. So, we have just five electrons to worry about. Let's think about the different combinations of spins that those electrons could have. First, all the spins could have the same value, which I'll represent using up arrows. It's also possible that the first four electrons have one spin, and the last one has the opposite spin. Also, the first three electrons could have one spin, and the last two could have the other spin. It seems like we could go on like this for quite a while, giving each possible arrangement of up and down arrows. But actually, these three combinations are all of the possibilities. How is that possible? Well, the thing we're interested in is the arrangements that can result in different energies. 
The arrangement with five arrows pointing up has one energy. The arrangement with four arrows up and one down gives a different energy, and so on. But now, consider this combination. This one has a total of four up arrows and one down arrow. We should expect this arrangement to have the same energy overall as this one. It doesn't matter which of the five arrows is pointing up, so the energy of both these arrangements will be the same. Now consider this arrangement. This one has a total of two up arrows and three down ones. But the meaning of the up and down arrows is completely arbitrary. The up arrows could be spin positive one half or negative one half, and vice versa for the down arrows. That means that this arrangement is completely identical to this one in which the directions of all the arrows have been reversed. And this arrangement is the same as this one, in which there are three up arrows and two down. So. It turns out that these three arrangements represent all the possibilities for this system. Now that we know that, we can determine the value of capital S for the three possibilities. The first state has five electrons with the same spin, so capital S is five halves. The second one has two electrons with opposite spins, so those two cancel out and the value of s overall is 3 halves. Finally, the third possibility has two pairs of electrons with opposite spin, so s overall is 1 half. The multiplicity of each state is given by this formula. So the first arrangement has a multiplicity of 6, which makes it a sextet. The second arrangement is a quartet, and the last one is a doublet. So far, we've looked at how the orbital angular momenta of two electrons can couple, and we've looked at how the spin angular momenta can couple. There's one more type of interaction to think about. It turns out that the orbital and spin angular momenta can couple to each other. This is another phenomenon that we'd never see in the large-scale world of our everyday experience, and it's called spin-orbit coupling. You might recall from video 20 that for a single electron, we can add the values of L and S to get the total angular momentum of the electron, which has the symbol J. So, suppose we have an electron in a dxz orbital. What values could we have for L, S, and J? Well, as you might remember from your general chemistry days, the value of L for a d orbital is 2, and that's true no matter which d orbital it is. Meanwhile, the value of S can be either negative one half or positive one half. That means the total angular momentum J could be 2 minus or 2 plus one half. So it's either 3 halves or 5 halves. It turns out that we can also determine the total angular momentum for a system using a formula similar to the ones we used for capital L and capital S. The lower limit of J is the absolute value of the difference between the overall orbital and spin angular momenta. And the upper limit is the sum of the orbital and spin angular momenta. For example, what could capital L S and J B for a sulfur atom. Well, sulfur has this electron configuration. The electrons are all paired except for the ones in the 3p orbital. There are four electrons in the p orbital. However, before we try to calculate capital L and S, remember what we learned about orbital diagrams back in video 21. In that video, we saw that in an orbital diagram, we draw a box for each value of the quantum number m that an orbital has. In sulfur, the electrons we're interested in are in the 3p orbital, and a p orbital has three different values of m. So in an orbital diagram, we represent this with three boxes. Now let's put electrons in these boxes. We have four electrons, so there are many different ways we could place the electrons in the boxes. 
However, because there are four electrons in only three boxes, it's guaranteed that two of the electrons will be paired. And that allows us to determine the range of values for capital L and S. Remember, paired electrons don't contribute to the overall momentum. So, when calculating L and S, we only need to consider two of the four electrons in the p orbital, because the other two are paired. Both of the remaining electrons have a value of 1 for little l. That means that capital L can have a lower limit of 0 and an upper limit of 2. Meanwhile, as we saw earlier in this video, when we have two electrons, the value of capital S can be 0 or 1. Now we're ready to determine the possible values of capital J, but we need to be careful. Not every combination of capital L and S is possible. For example, the combination of L equals 2 and S equals 1 can't actually happen. Why not? To understand which combinations of capital L and S are allowable, and therefore determine the total angular momentum J, we need to consider the quantum number M again. But before we do that, it's helpful to know that we can summarize the information about the values of capital L, S, and J in a shorthand way called a term symbol. A term symbol has this format. In this symbol, the superscript here is the multiplicity of the atom, and the subscript is the total angular momentum. The large symbol in the center needs a little explaining. You might recall that every atomic orbital has a different value for the quantum number of script L. For example, L equals 0 for an s orbital, 1 for a p orbital, 2 for a d orbital, and so on. To find the center part of the term symbol, we look at the numerical value of capital L and use the corresponding letter of the orbital that the number would represent. An example will help make this a little more clear. Suppose we have an atom for which the value of capital L is 2, capital S is 1, and capital J is 3 what would be the term symbol? The formula for the multiplicity of the atom is 2s plus 1, which gives us a multiplicity of 3. So that's the superscript on the left side. j equals 3, so that's the subscript on the right. What about the symbol in the middle? Well, the numerical value of l is 2, and a value of 2 for small l would represent a d orbital. So the middle part of the term symbol is capital D. Now that we know that, we can get back to our study of sulfur. Here's how we determine the values of L, S, and J for sulfur, and therefore determine its term symbol. First, we draw the portion of an orbital diagram that applies to the orbital where the electrons reside. It's a p orbital, so we draw three connected boxes. Above the boxes, we'll write the values of m, which are positive 1, 0, and negative 1. Next, we'll put arrows representing the electrons into the boxes. We'll put 2 in the first box and an up arrow in each of the other boxes. However, this isn't the only way we could have arranged the arrows. In fact, far from it. We could also have placed the paired electrons in the second box, or in the third one. But that's not all. Instead of up arrows, the two unpaired electrons could both point downward. That would give us these three possibilities. In addition, one of the unpaired arrows could point up and the other could point down, which gives us these six possibilities. Finally, the four electrons could be arranged in two sets of pairs, instead of one pair and two unpaired. That would give us these three additional possibilities. That's a lot of different arrangements. We call each of these arrangements a microstate, and in this case, there are 15 different microstates.
Well, our next step is to determine ml, the sum of the different values of the quantum number m for the electrons in each microstate. We'll also calculate ms, the sum of the different values of s for each microstate. For example, the top microstate has two electrons with m equal to 1, one with m equal to 0, and one with m equal to negative 1. That gives us a total of 1 for ml. If we do that for all the different microstates, here's what we get. Now let's look at the values of s. Let's say that the up arrows represent electrons with a spin of positive 1 half, and the down arrows have a spin of negative 1 half. That means the first microstate has a value of 1 for ms. If we do that for each microstate, here's what we get. For our next step, let's summarize all this information by making a little chart. Across the top of the chart, we'll write the different possible values of ms. Notice that all the values of ms we got are either positive 1, 0, or negative 1. Meanwhile, on the left side of the chart, we'll write all the possible values of ml. Notice that these were always between positive 2 and negative 2. So here's what our chart looks like. Now, in each slot of the chart, we'll write the number of microstates that have the corresponding combination of ml and ms. Let's start with the first slot, where ml equals 2 and ms equals 1. If you look at the list of microstates we determined, you'll see that none of them have that combination of ml and ms, so we'll leave that spot on the chart blank. In the next spot, we have ml equals 2 and then s equals 0. If we look at the list of microstates, we find out that just one microstate has that combination. If we continue this process for the whole chart, here's what we get. As you can see, this chart is symmetric both on the left and right sides and on the top and bottom halves. This will always be true, no matter what atom it is that we're determining the term symbols for. We're almost done now. In the next step, we look at the pattern we got. We can think of this chart as a series of rectangles layered on top of each other, with each rectangle symmetric around the center of the chart. The numbers in this chart tell us how many layers are on top of each other at each particular spot. Our task now is to identify each of the layers. For example, one of the layers must include this spot at the top of the chart. Since this is the only entry in the top row, we know it must have a width of just one. And since we know that each layer is symmetric with respect to the middle of the chart, this layer must stretch all the way down to the bottom row. Let's take that layer out of the chart and put it over here. If we look at the remaining chart, we can see that there's only one place left that has more than one layer. So there must be a layer in the center of the chart that has the height and width of just one. If we take that layer out of the chart, here's what we get. So now we've separated the chart into three different layers. So we're finally ready to determine the values of capital L, S, and J, and write the term symbols of the atom. It turns out that each of these layers represents one or more term symbols. The width of the layer is equal to 2S plus 1 for those term symbols, and the height is equal to 2L plus 1. So, for example, this layer has a width of 1, so capital S must be equal to 0. Meanwhile, the height is 5, so capital L has a value of 2. That tells us that the term symbol represented by this layer will have a superscript of 1, and the central part of the term symbol will be capital D. 
What about the subscript? Well, remember, the value of capital J is given by this formula. Since L is 2 and S is 0, that means that J can only be equal to 2. So this is the overall term symbol. Now let's look at the second layer. Here, the width is 1, so S is equal to 0 again. The height is also 1, so that means that L is equal to 0. Meanwhile, using the formula for J tells us that J also must have a value of 0. That means the term symbol has a superscript of 1, a central symbol of capital S, and a subscript of 0. Finally, the last layer has a width and a height of 3. That means that S and L are both equal to 1. That means the superscript in our term symbol is 3, and the central symbol is P. What about J? Well, when we look at the formula for J, we find that it has a lower limit of 0 and an upper limit of 2. That means that J could have values of 0, 1, or 2. All three of these are possible, so this layer represents three different term symbols. So, we've discovered that sulfur has a total of five different possible term symbols. That was a lot of work. We'll get a lot of practice determining term symbols for different atoms in class and in the homework you'll find out that it gets a lot easier with a little practice. Before we finish, there's one more thing to talk about regarding term symbols. Each of the term symbols represents a group of microstates that have a certain energy. We know that each possible electronic energy level has a potential surface like the ones that we saw in the previous video, but how do we know which term symbol corresponds to each of the electronic energy levels? Here's how we find out. First of all, it's useful to know that each term symbol might represent several different microstates, each with the same energy. In other words, such microstates are degenerate, and the degeneracy is given by the formula 2j plus 1. For example, in the case of our sulfur atom, the term symbol 1s0 has a degeneracy of just 1 so it only represents one microstate. Meanwhile, the symbol 3p1 has a degeneracy of 3, so it represents three degenerate microstates. Now let's determine the order of energies of this group of term symbols. To do so, we use a very easy method proposed by the German physicist Friedrich Hund, another great physicist who was a young man living in Europe during World War II, like Niels Bohr and Wolfgang Pauli. Hund lived to be 101 years old, so maybe being a scientist is good for your health. Anyway, his method for determining the order of energies for the different term symbols are known as Hund's rules, and there's just three of them. Rule 1 says that states with higher values of capital S have lower energies. That tells us the 1d2 and 1s0 term symbols are higher in energy than the other three term symbols. Rule 2 tells us that for states with the same s value, states with higher values of capital L have lower energies. That means that the 1s0 level has a higher energy than the 1d2. Finally, Rule 3 is a little different depending on the atom we're looking at. Rule 3 tells us that for states with the same values of both S and L, then states with higher values of capital J have lower energies if the electrons we're looking at are in an orbital that's more than half full. However, if the orbital is half full or less, then states with higher values of capital J have higher energies. What does that mean for our sulfur atom? Well, the 3p orbital of sulfur is more than half full, so the three term symbols that start with 3p will have this order. Now that we've done that, 
we can see that the order of the term symbols from lowest energy to highest energy is this. That means that the 3p2 term symbol represents the ground state of a sulfur atom. Well, that's enough new material for today. You've learned a lot in this video, and most of it was probably pretty new to you. You'll get plenty of practice in class, but feel free to come see me in the office or talk to me in class if anything seems unclear. In the next video, we'll be talking about lasers, a brand new and very fun topic for us. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.